Hello, thank you for tuning in to this webinar on current plain spotted skunk research. This is a pre recorded presentation, so feel free to email any questions you may have to the individual researchers or to the Texas Comptroller's Office. The objective of this webinar is to provide updates on the ongoing research on the plain spotted skunk. I have listed presenters in order here. First, I will give an introduction to the Natural Resources Program at the Texas Comptroller's Office. Then, we'll hear updates from researchers in Texas and Oklahoma. My name is Lauren Borland, and I work in the Natural Resources Program. First, I wanted to give a brief overview of our work here. I've included my email address on this slide. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions about our program in general or the work that we fund. This program receives dedicated funds from the Texas legislature to fund scientific research on imperiled, threatened, or endangered species, and also to provide assistance to local communities regarding endangered species conservation. We identify priorities for our research program based on factors such as federal listing decisions, existing knowledge gaps, and the potential impacts of a listing decision. One of the goals of the program is to provide decision makers with the best available and accurate science to benefit stakeholders and protect our natural resources. The plain spotted skunk is a wide ranging but cryptic species. Because the species is difficult to detect, not much is known about the ecology of the plain spotted skunk. Gaps in the knowledge for species can influence any potential decisions that the Fish and Wildlife Service makes which can have economic impacts on Texans. Our office funds research in order to close these data gaps and ensure any decisions are made with the most up-to-date information. This is the timeline from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on the species status assessment for the plain spotted skunk. The species priority at the federal level is considered as bin three, meaning that new science is underway to inform key uncertainties about the species and answer key questions that might influence the petition finding. The lead region at the Fish and Wildlife Service for looking at the status of the species is Region 3, and the upcoming document we are expecting next is the 12-month finding, which will summarize the currently known status of the species. This is the estimated timeline for the SSA, which informs the 12-month finding. Work is expected to commence on the document in December of 2020, with a 12-month finding published in the Federal Register around April 2023. Any questions about the services listing process for the plain spotted skunk may be directed to the Region 3 office. So we'll now transition to hearing updates from researchers studying the plain spotted skunk. If you have any questions for the researchers about their work, feel free to contact them directly or email me and I can relay any questions. Hello, this is uh, Robert Dowler. I'm uh, at Angelo State University, and I want to try and give you a, an update on our research on plain spotted skunks here in, in Texas. Uh, to begin with, this is a collaborative project between Texas Tech University and Angelo State University. Um, at Texas Tech University, Richard Stevens is uh, the co-lead with myself uh, here at Angelo State. But the people who actually should be uh, presenting this uh, presentation are these people. On the right is Clint Perkins. He's a PhD student working at Texas Tech. In the middle is Cameron Jefferson. Uh, she's my master's student uh, here at Angela State. And on the left is Matt Hamilton, also uh, working on a master's here at Angela State University. So a little about our project history. We began a three-year survey of, of spotted skunks in Texas. And the, the outcome, at least in part for that study, was uh, locating a population in the Katy Prairie region of southeastern Texas, which is uh, very near uh, Houston, as I'll show you in a moment. Uh, our project objectives are to conduct spatial ecology analysis, and we're, uh, uh, we're going to be doing this by site as well as uh, between sexes and, and seasonally. Uh, we're also going to look at distribution and niche modeling, especially for the Katy Prairie region itself. We will have uh, rest site and den site uh, ecology, uh, again, both males and females, and hopefully seasonally. Uh, we're going to look for causes of mortality if that occurs, and uh, look at population demograph demographics again for that Katy Prairie population. 
We're also trying to look at competition, at least for denning and spatial ecology, between spotted skunks and striped skunks. And lastly, we're going to look at the broader question of the mesocarnivore community and how uh, spotted skunks in particular interact with the remainder of that community. So the Katy Prairie, as I mentioned, is outside of Houston, and here in, in green is the, um, is the Katy Prairie area that we will be working. Uh, Houston is over here, and, and you're uh, less than 20 miles outside of, of uh, Houston proper. It originally was this tall grass fire evolved system, but it's uh, been heavily altered, as uh, you might expect, from agriculture, grazing, and, and increasingly by urbanization. Uh, the Katy Prairie Conservancy is an organization that's uh, tasked with trying to preserve what remains and expand areas that might have the potential for um, returning this area to a pure prairie uh, habitat. And our sites are essentially all prairie pasture and agriculture, uh, 63 and 31 percent respectively, uh, very little forest or, or scrub habitat. Our methods include live trapping. Uh, we're uh, using grids of traps 100 meters apart. When we capture a skunk, we anesthetize it, take morphometric data as well as biological samples, and we fit the animals with GPS collars. And we're, we're using Lotex Microlite 20s, and we have programmed these with uh, fixes to be taken every 24-hour period, eight, eight of those. And recently, we've dropped that to four to see if we can improve our, our battery life on, on these collars. So we uh, track them, the skunks on a weekly basis, and there's a VHF signal that we, we are able to pick up on the ground. Uh, and if we can get close enough to the animal, we can then download all of those accumulated points during the previous uh, time from the collar itself. We also record the resting sites and then do vegetation analysis at those sites within two weeks. Our live trapping efforts began in February and are continuing today. We've accumulated about 6,500 trap nights. And throughout the entire uh, period, our uh, capture rate is uh, 0.5 captures per uh, 100 trap nights. And uh, we peaked in the summer. For the summer season, we had uh, right at 1% trap success for spotted skunks. That uh, came out to 33 captures of 14 individual skunks. Sex ratio was eight males and six females. And the ratio of adults to, to juveniles, for the vast majority were adults. We only had two juveniles this past summer. So as far as our skunk collars, they're collecting usable data on about 45% of our fixes. And so 25% of the fixes, there's insufficient number of satellites to uh, get good fixes, and about 30% are not accurate enough. Uh, and we set this accuracy at about 10 meters. We may expand that to increase the number of fixes, but right now that's what we're looking at. And for those callers that are programmed for eight fixes, uh, that gives us about 24 usable fixes a week uh, at four here at the bottom. That will reduce it to about 12 usable fixes per week. But at the eight fix per, per day, uh, our collar life was about 105 days. And uh, Lotex software estimated for our, our programming that it should be about 116. So we're a little, a little off from that. Nine out of our 14 uh, skunks, um, we have sufficient data to analyze. And we're defining that by, by greater than 30 locations per season. And that gave us uh, two in a partial winter season last year when we began, uh, three in the spring, six in the summer, and four this fall. And we haven't started doing the, the spatial data analysis as of yet. But here's what the, the data look like. If um, for This is for a male uh, taken in, uh, first collared in, sept excuse me, in June, and uh, remained collared from June through September. And the white points are uh, all of the, the points. The red stars are actually diurnal points. Um, and then the black diamonds are places that we walked in and, uh, and got uh, fixes on uh, the animal in the field. And uh, it's not too surprising, but if you look at the distribution of these, if you were trying to determine home range size, for example, on the basis of just the diurnal resting sites or the daytime fixes, 
you'd uh, severely underestimate the uh, the home range for this this individual. So we're going to be working on on uh, the analysis of this in the coming weeks. Our habitat survey, we uh, did a standard uh, vegetation analysis at each resting site and then had a paired site uh, that we also uh, did a vegetation analysis at 100 meters away. Uh, I won't go through all the parameters, but it's the standard uh, vegetation and some soil uh, features that we're uh, measuring. So we've done 69 of these resting sites so far, 16 in the spring, 47 in the summer, and six this fall. Um, we have yet to do any maternal den sites, and this is because uh, we did not start getting females until the summer, and we're hoping this, uh, this spring to rectify that situation and be able to address uh, maternal rest, uh, resting sites. Uh, the, the big take home was that McCartney rose bushes are uh, certainly one of the major features of our habitat. There, more than 75% of our, our resting sites were in uh, these dense uh, McCartney rose habitats. We used, uh, for the camera trap survey, a, a stratified random sampling uh, based on the percentages of habitat. Uh, we we're doing three different camera ty types, Bushnell trophy cams and two types of Reconics, Hyperfire 1s, uh, which are a little older, and Reconics Hyperfire 2s, which are the more recent model checked and rebated these things on a seven-day period over a, a three-week uh, survey sampling effort. The analysis that we've been able to do so far is uh, looking at how many, what types of cameras, uh, how well they did operationally, and then secondly, the uh, ability of the cameras to detect spotted skunks. So between January and November, we've had 25 total detections. Uh, only one in the winter, seven in summer, excuse me, seven in spring and fall, at least to date, and then 10 during the summer. That was over, for the two complete seasons, spring and summer, that was 30, over 3,500 survey nights. And uh, detections per 100 survey nights for the different types of cameras, uh, the hyperfire, to the modern, uh, the more recent, I should say, um, model of Reconics was at 0.89, and the older Reconics were at 0.2. Uh, Bushnell was at 0.62, and uh, if you look at the uh, remaining operational, uh, both the Reconics remained operational almost uh, exclusively throughout the time period, uh, but Bushnells were. Uh, were low, and uh, the reason for that is that blowing grass and other movement uh, tended to fill up our SD cards uh, by the fourth night, and if we didn't get back out there, we were losing uh, some obvious data that potentially was taken when uh, the cards were full. Uh, as I said before, McCartney Rose are, the, are by far the most uh, important resource that we've found to date. Uh, they provide both cover and from the weather and also uh, likely uh, protection from predators. And in our site, there's uh, essentially no overstory canopy compared to those uh, studies that have been done in, um, in Missouri and Arkansas and in South Carolina, et cetera. Lastly, on um, our, uh, we're looking at the management of this area, and it's an active uh, cattle ranch with uh, oil uh, exploration as well. And that range management includes clearing uh, and bush hogging of habitat. And as, as a result, we've watched uh, several of our skunks uh, ha having to move out from favored areas uh, to less disturbed habitats. So there's no doubt that there's uh, implications for the management on, on these skunks, uh, at least at our site. Uh, the other thing that was kind of interesting is our summer sampling resulted in actually higher, uh, equal to or higher detections than spring or fall. And that's in uh, contrast to what was has been published for Arkansas and Missouri populations in these forested areas. Summer was uh, had very low detection rates, and we had um, uh, the reverse situation in our prairie site. So I'd like to finish by uh, thanking the Texas Comptroller's Office of Public Accounts. Uh, Lauren Borland is our uh, contact there. Thank you much. And Jody Caceres and uh, Katie Plum are our uh, providing logistics support here at Angelo State University. And uh, lastly, it's, uh, we uh, really appreciate Katy Prairie Conservancy, the Warren family, and Lost family for access to our study sites. And that's all I have for right now, and our contact information is there. Thank you very much.
My name is Kaylin Branham. I'm working on my master's degree at the University of Central Oklahoma, and part of my thesis research is to get detection and habitat selection data of eastern spotted skunks in southeastern Oklahoma. So the purpose of this research is to determine the distribution trends of eastern spotted skunks in southeast Oklahoma and to also explore potential differences in the, in the detectability in relation to variables in their habitat, for, such as the habitat characteristics and the presence of other species in the area. On the historical distribution slide without any um, animation, um, so as is mentioned often when discussing eastern spotted skunks, there seemed to have been a decline across their range. And to reiterate that, uh, before the 1940s and 50s, eastern spotted skunks were a very common fur-bearing species throughout their range. Uh, during the 1940s, there seemed to be a decrease in harvest that was shown to be about 1% of previous seasons. And then after the 1950s, conservationists determined that the species had undergone a decline in its population of greater than about 90%. So um, this map shows Oklahoma tracker data from around 1977 to 1984. It showed that the highest trapping rate was between 1 and 6.4 individuals per 100 square miles. So the, one, the light white colored counties were zero, and then the darker sh only showed, like I said before, between 1 and 6.4 on average. Um, eastern spotted skunks harvested per 100 kilometers. So if you go to the, you click an animation, there shows a picture. This picture shows that eastern spotted skunk pelts were in western Oklahoma. Um, this picture was most likely taken near, near Sharon, Oklahoma, which is um, over here on the map if you click through and the star will pop up and show where that picture was probably taken. So this picture doesn't prove that eastern spotted skunks were found in this area, but they were, it kind of hints that they were found around this area for it to be in a picture that was most likely taken in that area. So now it's believed that eastern spotted skunks have an extremely centralized distribution in the United States when compared to those past no, known localities and sightings. And um, a lot of people argue that that's due to habitat suitability. So we'll go to the next slide and talk about the study area. My study area will include the counties encompassing the Wachita Mountains of southeast Oklahoma, primarily focused on the floor and the Curtin County. Um, if we will expand in the surrounding counties, but that will depend on our initial findings and it will be kind of fluid throughout the project. And then um, the study is only conducted on public and private land where permission is granted. So on to the next slide. The study area, um, or the land use of the study area, shows to be um, mostly comprised of deciduous forest and evergreen forest, and then the hay pasture for agricultural use, which is pretty widespread across Oklahoma. So um, in these deciduous forests, there are a lot of oak and hickory species kind of mixed among the, the areas. And then the pine forest is mostly loblolly and shortleaf pine. OK, so for the camera trapping slide, um, between the months of October 2018 and April 2019, there are 25 reconnect hyperfire cameras that will be, will be deployed in areas of McCurtain and LaFleur counties. So each one of these cameras are going to be set at a distance of 500 meters apart, and they're focused on baited tree that's baited with rosebud skunk paste and on-target on liquid grub lure. Um, both of these lures are sold as bait for striped skunk pest control. Camera locations will change once a month in order to both gather enough data and increase the area surveyed. So during that time, camera locations will not be disturbed by researchers during deployment to decrease the potential avoidance to human presence. Locations with confirmed eastern spotted skunk sightings will have those cameras deployed for the duration of the season, and this should aid in understanding detectability.
So we're going to measure canopy cover, average tree height, understory density, and then um, the forest type, land use. That will all be measured on site. Terrain will be measured using ArcGIS, and all of these factors will be important for determining habitat preference for spotted skunks and other mesocarnivores, as well as providing insightful information as to what other species might commonly co-inhabit the area with eastern spotted skunks. All of these results are a summary of our first field season. So our second field season started at the beginning of October, and we're still waiting on the data for those first points. So for the first season, there were 67 camera locations, and that was out of 2,596 trap nights. Eastern spotted skunks were only found in three of those locations, and only two had one occurrence. The other one had a more ideal picture with nine visitations, which was really nice to see. And then if you uh, click further, I have those two locations on the map, and then that one location with nine visitations pops up later. So moving on to the first site, um, this location, the habitat characteristics showed a canopy cover of about 96%. Um, the understory vegetation height was um, a small visual obstruction, about 9.37 centimeters, with the average tree height being about 11.9 meters. This camera was one of the sites found in a pilot study, so the camera was set up for the, the entire field season that I was out. Um, so it was set on January 28th, and our first visitation and only visitation was also on January 28th at 8.49 p.m. that night. So here are some pictures on the next slide of the eastern spotted skunk we found that one time. Um, and it was the first animal that we detected on that camera at that site, and then it was the only animal for 29 hours before a striped skunk visited that area. So the second location that we found the eastern spotted skunk was also that uh, location we found in the pilot study. So it was also set out for 47 days. The habitat characteristics of that location showed a similar canopy cover of 96%. Um, the understory vegetation was polar opposite. It was very dense um, with 45.6 average height for the um, understory. And then the average tree height was twice as tall as the previous site, about 20.2 meters. To identify these animals was a bit impossible based on the pictures that we got, which I'll show you in the next slide. Um, but it's just uh, an amazing habitat that we actually got this many visitations. It wasn't characteristic for the rest of the, the sites that we found them in. The bottom left picture, I added this picture just to show that we're not getting these full images of the eastern spotted skunks to be able to differentiate them from individuals. So the middle picture is actually the best picture we had at this location, and the top right picture was the one we got most often. So the, even though we got visitations pretty often, it would be nice to be able to tell if they were the same individual or not, but that's just not possible. This location was a new location that we found during that field season. Um, the canopy cover was more open than the previous two. The understory vegetation height was not as, um, there wasn't as much visual obstruction as there were in the past. There were 6.33 centimeters was average, and then the average tree height was about 20 meters, which is about the same as the one I just talked about. This camera was deployed for 57 days. Uh, it was set on March 16th. Um, the first and only visitation was on March 20th at uh, 2.30, oh, almost 2.30 in the morning. So this camera wasn't meant to be deployed for 57 days, but it was due to the flooding in the area. We couldn't pick up the camera, but it didn't seem to have an effect because the only visitation that we had was four days after we set the camera. These are the pictures that we got from that one visitation. So it kind of looks like the partial picture that we got in the last location. We found the skunk 24 hours after a raccoon visited, and then there was no activity until two weeks later when a gray fox visited this area. So the summary of the first field season um, showed that there was a 0.045% location success, which was three out of 67 cameras. Um, the trap nights resulted in 0.004% 
success, and that was only 10 nights out of almost 2,600. We found that they are found in areas with varying habitats, and then when we looked at habitats that were almost identical, the habitats that share those same characteristics, we didn't find any eastern spotted skunks. So a large takeaway with this is that We've had extensive effort in looking for eastern spotted skunks. We've targeted these animals, but we have little results in actually finding them. And so at the next slide, expected results. At the completion of our second and final field season, we hope to have additional eastern spotted skunk locations, be able to identify variables that are driving that distribution, and then we hope to understand the average detectability in order to benefit methods of future research. This will conclude our webinar on the Plain Spotted Skunk Research Updates. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. For further updates and reports from the Comptroller's Program, make sure to visit our webpage for this project as well. Thank you.